when I finish a set and everybody walks into the set and they say, oh, it's great, it's beautiful, of course that's nice. I don't really care about that. I certainly have gone ahead on this with some trepidation because it's a huge thing. All I care about is that the drama that the actors and the director are trying to assemble in front of the lens, that that is cradled in an environment that's perfect for what they're doing, for who their characters are, and for the story that's trying to be told. Everything beyond that, I'm just simply not interested. I'm lucky enough to, to have gotten David Brisman, who's an excellent production designer. The whole idea is to experience the full kind of range of emotional texture. On one hand, we had a certain advantage, and that is that a look had already been established. So what we wanted to do with Bella was just to show something that indicated a little bit more maturity on her part, because she was moving from grade 11 to grade 12. Chris is a different director. He was looking for a different palette world and a slightly different mood world. So Bella's nest that we were trying to achieve here had a little bit more warmth to it that existed as the location in Portland. So here we had to build the interior and the exterior, but there's this enormous sequence that involves Jacob sort of parkouring into her window, and it's one of the most important scenes between them in the movie. In the first house, if you look very, very carefully, there's a flicker of a moment when you can see actually that side of the house and there's no bay window there. So it was worth it to deviate from the old diagram to find the diagram that supported this little bit of storytelling. The Cullen's house was even trickier than Bella's. In the Cullen house, it was more like adding to an existing puzzle. In the first film, you actually do see the exterior fairly clearly. What we tried to do was bring that very specific palette of the exterior into the interior, and that was a way of knitting those pieces together. Primarily, Edward was dressed in a two-piece suit with a dark blue linen shirt. It took a lot of time to come up with the formula for creating that suit. I tried to find a fabric that wasn't contemporary, something that was interesting to look at because he was going to be wearing it all the time. We then followed a very contemporary cut for the suit, so we had his suits made for him. I just think it looks, it looks great. With Jacob's house, we found this fantastic location. Chris knew when he saw it that was the place he wanted to be Jacob's world. The fellow who owned the house built it when he was 17 as his sort of ideal cabin. Everything seemed perfect, but it was a greenhouse. It was really, really beautiful as a greenhouse. So I struggled with that, but there's a desire in the fan base to really keep the red of Jacob's house. So we photoshopped and looked at how it was in red, and it was still pretty wonderful. So we ended up painting the whole place red to match the book. When we were dressing the werewolves, what we wanted to do was to find something that made them look sexy. We knew that we had to put them in cutoffs, but it wasn't going to be short shorts. <laughs> Again, with him, we also wanted to show him moving from being a boy into a young man. So we shortened all of his shirts. We took in his tees to reflect the fact that he had these new great biceps. You try to maintain a coherence so that nothing seems unrealistic or bizarre. And when we go to Italy, the key is to cast it and to design it in such a way that it doesn't pop completely from the story, but it's still an integral and beautiful part of the whole thing. At the beginning, the numbers of extras that are going to be part of our massive Italian festival scene were to be determined. It started off as 350, then it grew to 400, and then someone asked me, well, how many do you really think you can do? Well, now it's 700. We came up with a simple formula that we thought would be almost like one size fits all. We also found an interesting shape that was a little bit more foreboding. So we're doing 20 of those. My assistant took samples to Italy and I leave on Thursday and hopefully I will see 700 <laughs> costumes ready for me. We were basically able in pre-production to make a tour of the 10 most gorgeous hill towns of Tuscany and Lombardy. The choice of Montepulciano as our Volterra was a sort of big discussion and we really worked on that to get it right. 
When we were going around and looking at talents, I was watching which things Chris would respond to. I could see what he was thinking in symmetrical terms. He was doing the Renaissance version as opposed to the sort of kind of used up realm of Gothic vampires. With the details on the interior of the hall, we ripped off shamelessly from quite known examples of Tuscan architecture. There's a lot of green and white marble used in various Tuscan cathedrals. The story posited an endless corridor, and because we now have CG technology and can actually create endless corridors without a lot of effort, I was intrigued by the idea of doing it within real architecture, where there's no question that there's actually architecture that the actors are moving through, so that where you begin, you cannot see the end. The key point that Chris wanted to impart was that the Volturi were very elegant. In the 21st century, we tried to make them as dark as possible, with the character Aro being the darkest of all, because he has the most power. In the 1790s, I did the reverse, and I tried to make Aro the lightest of possible, so that we could then see him at the top point of that triangular color palette. The idea of inscribing Latin in the hall was something that came from Chris. He just loves the idea of languages. So there were a few specific Latin sayings that he came up with and wanted us to include, but you know, we went to town. I sort of selected ones that seem particularly suitable. They do refer to this story. There's nothing in there that says, you know, give me all the money in the world or write a check to my father. One of them says the law above all things, and another says your death is my life, and another says life is short, art is long, which is kind of an interesting one in terms of making films because you know that when you make a film it's gonna knock around for a really long time. Ah, bing. Single. Him down to her. Single. This is actually Bella, believe it or not. Yeah, help, help her up. Help her up. Ah, you're okay. <sighs> no, now we're getting out to get out of the scene here. Let's get out. Up, 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 up you go. Up this you go. film has, at its heart, romance. The nice intersection between Stephanie Meyer's storytelling and Chris Weitz's directing had to do with finding the sort of aesthetic component to romance. I think we were pretty successful. You know that the film is probably going to live longer than you are, and in fact will achieve its own life.